This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. You know, there's a fire that's kind of building up on the inside of me. The last couple of conferences I have done, um, anytime I talk about the fire of God, it just begins to take hold stronger and stronger. I want to back up a little bit. In fact, I'm having a hard time not preaching on the fire of God. I just got back from preaching that and I'm going to be on the Hagman uh, Report Tuesday night, and I'm going to deal with the fire of God and taking back America. And so, it's kind of hard not to go down that rabbit trail tonight. But I want to back up. I know in our last session we dealt with the wrestling that goes on with principalities and powers, but I really need to back up for a little bit and just pause for a little bit, if I may. And just go with the Lord is taking me because I see so many that misinterpret Ephesians chapter 2 regarding spiritual warfare. And really, Ephesians chapter 2 is not, is not a chapter on spiritual warfare. There's a lot more going on. And I guess I'm going to be able to just preach as long as I want today because my timer is not going on. There we go. I'll do like Henry Groover, the timer got stuck, so he just preached to midnight. That conference last year in Dallas. You know, one of the, the things that we need to use in developing a proper hermeneutic regarding the Word of God is we've got to move beyond snippet theology, put everything back into context. Anytime something is taken out of context, it becomes a pretext. And a pretext sounds real good, but it's just not true. And we hear that all the time in all the political ads that are going on that almost make me nauseous. But what even makes me more nauseous and concerned is when we have snippet theology in the Word of God and you take things out of context. Besides the text, there are four things you need, and a good friend of mine, Dr. Carl Koch, is always harping on this because it is so necessary. You need history. You need geography, you need culture, and you need grammar. And you've got to have all four to properly interpret the Word of God. Now, Ephesians is probably one of the most potent of all of the uh, epistles written by the Apostle Paul. But we need to understand the context in which it was written. He did not write it in a vacuum. Now, there is no precipitating factor that he begins his epistle with that is evident in the epistle. You know, like when you can go into 1 Corinthians, you can see the division that was there. There were problems. He learned how to write epistles at the feet of Gamaliel. And so, to the unobservant reader, it would seem like he simply wrote it in a vacuum, yet he did not. When we read the book of Acts, now Acts is a historical overview 
of the working of the Holy Spirit in the early church. We find that the Apostle Paul was in Ephesus for two years, 54 and 55, ministering the gospel. And then when we get into chapters 13 and 14 of Acts, we deal with what happened in his missionary trip to that he stayed in Ephesus. And one of the reasons why the book of Ephesians is so powerful, he spent two years teaching Messiah, teaching Torah, teaching the Word of God, all day long, every day for two years. How would you like to have been a fly on the wall or have been able to have those audio lectures of the Apostle Paul teaching day in and day out for two years? It had a massive impact on that city. Ephesus was a spiritual stronghold for the goddess Diana. That they were world famous for the worship of Diana in Ephesus. It was a big part of their commerce is making the little trinkets and all the religious stuff and all the occult stuff associated with this fertility goddess. She was the patron ruler of darkness over Ephesus. And it began to impact the commerce. It began to impact the city. So many Gentiles were leaving paganism and coming into the assembly of those called out of the mystery religions that it began to affect the pocketbook of the idol makers. And instead of them following the example of Abraham, who used to be an idol maker, and he left Babylon and crossed over into the things of God, they decided it is time for us to put a stop to this, and they caused a riot in Ephesus, so much so that in the temple for two hours all the worshipers of Diana shook that place saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! For two straight hours, it kind of sounds like some of the democratic stuff today going on, if you know what I mean. And although the clerk or the official in the area was able to squell the rebellion, how many know that after that period, there was great persecution against the saints in Ephesus. They understood the pagan gods, not like we do now, that we're, we're completely dumb to them. That we realize that they are the spirits of the Nephilim. They are the spirits of the watchers. They are the spirits of those that fell at Genesis 6 and Genesis 11. And that they're real. And that there is wrath motivated within the culture. And so part of what the Apostle Paul is dealing with in Ephesians is, is really detailing to these Gentiles, and we see this all throughout the book of Ephesians, specifically in Ephesians 2, because what the Apostle Paul does is he begins laying the groundwork, and then he does this Hebraic, very rabbinical contrasting back and forth. You were in darkness, but you're out. You were in rebellion, but you're out. You were with no hope, without God in the world, but now you have hope, and now you're part of the commonwealth of Israel. And what we've already studied in the series, what that means is that when they accepted Messiah, they were a pagan. They were under the rulership of Diana in that city. The minute that they got saved, they were translated into a new kingdom and no longer fell under the authority of this demigod known as Diana. Now, in that context, let's go back and read part of Ephesians. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 1. I've got a lot here I want to read, and I will stop for comment in, in a few places because it just really preaches real good, and it really brings out what we need to do. Starting in verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love for all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mentioning of you in my prayers. Well, how many know that he would be since he wrote this around 65, 60, 65? He was, in many believe, he was in prison in Rome. 
And he already knows what happened back in 54 and 55 at the wrath of Diana and the worshipers of Diana. So when you hear the church is growing again, the church is thriving again in midst of persecution. He says, man, he says, I rejoice when I hear this and I never cease to make mention of you in my prayers because he's saying, you know what? Those that live in Ephesus, they have a hard row to hoe. Knowing that at any minute, if Christianity would once again begin to dominate the city to affect the commerce of those that worship Diana, there was going to be hell to pay. That is the backdrop of the book of Ephesians. Okay. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that, me, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now notice all this is Jesus specific. His inheritance. His inheritance. His inheritance. What did we read in Deuteronomy? I'm going to give all mankind unto these principalities and powers to the Bnei Elohim that have failed, but I will have for me an inheritance out of Jacob. And what he's trying to teach them is you got grafted into Jacob. You were a conniver just like Jacob, but I got to wrestle with you with the preaching of the gospel, and you have come in. This is Christ-centric not believer-centric. He's trying to get them to realize that they are now a part of the heritage of Messiah coming out of every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His mighty power? How many know it took mighty power to deliver you from that principality or power, rule, or darkness that controls the whole earth? to get you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. It took the power of God to do that. Once again, it is still Jesus-centric in what he did. When he got you, it's because you're his inheritance. You're his. You're no longer Diana's. You're his. Am I making sense? Let me stop right here and tell you something else. You do not belong to your past. Your past does not define you. What that darkness did in you before you got saved does not define who you are now. You were set free from it. So when the enemy tries to come back and to bring it up, your response is, that has nothing on a dead man. That old man died. This new man has nothing to do with that and is the inheritance of Jesus. I've just made myself happy. You can get happy if you want to, all right? Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Now listen to this in light of Diana and all the principalities and powers and all the, the multiplicity of gods within the old pagan world. Listen to what the apostle Paul says, not just above, far above all principalities and powers and mights and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come, that there will be a never another one that will have the position that Jesus has. And even if a new one would blink into being and had a mighty name in the earth, it would still be under his name. I'm starting to feel like that giggle coming on Gary Hedrick used to have every once in a while when he was my pastor years ago and he'd just get so excited about the word he'd just sit and giggle, you know. <laughs> and hath put all things under his feet and given him to be head over all things to the assembly, which is his body, the fullness of of him that filleth all and all. How many know that sounds like a real good deal? He has been set far above. He is ruling from the third heaven. Everything from the third heaven down now is subject to Jesus. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He, in fact, is the creator who took on human flesh and gave himself for us. Like I've shared many times, 
In the creation of man, Jesus got his hands dirty when he created man, and it was a prophetic image that one day he would have to get his hands dirty, redeeming that very same man. If you want to keep on getting happy, let's go on to the next chapter, okay? And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, who were in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. If you're walking according to the course of this world, you're walking under the auspices of principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. That's what he's talking about here. The culture and the way that they had created civilization and the way they control civilization The way they control culture, you were just flowing in it just like a stick floating downstream. You had no choice. You were caught by their currents. That's what he's talking about here. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience. There's a contrast here. You were a child of disobedience, but he's going to flip it on you here in a minute because you're not anymore. How many like that? I want to be an obedient child to Almighty God. Among whom we all had our past our conversations and pastimes in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, but God, I, I tell you what, some of the most powerful words in the Word of God are but and therefore. Because it'll flip it on a dime. It looked like we were all dead and it got dark, but God. There came a flood to judge man, but God talked to Noah. We were surrounded by Assyrians, but God sent an angel. We were prisoners and we were slaves in Egypt, but God sent Moses. (laughs) What we don't realize when the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, Derek Gilbert does an outstanding job on this, that that when when they had the the Red Sea behind them, they were looking looking at the mountain of Baal, where his throne was. And so all of Israel turned to the throne and said, See you later, sucker! As God parted the Red Sea and they walked across. And when Baal's army, because that Baal there was one of the original gods of Egypt, God wiped out the army. Said, let me show you. So that Baal... Because it's prophetic. You know, in Egypt, it was Osiris. It was this one or that one. But the first thing they did is as they're going to take Canaan land, which was full of Baals, they went to the throne of Baal and said, you're sorry too. Because God's going to give us the land. God set us free and you can't hold us here either. And it was prophetic that when they went across, because then they would take, they've already been to his throne and, and saw God defeat the Pharaoh's army at the throne of Baal. What were any Baals in comparison in all of Canaan land? Let's see if I can get back to Ephesians here. This is so good. But God, who in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for grace you are saved. For by grace we are saved through faith. It is not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you didn't get saved by works, but once you got saved, you were recreated for works, something the church has lost. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which means your hands should get busy after you're saved. Which God hath ordained, before ordained, that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that we, being in past time Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Once again, contrasting. This is the way all your neighbors are. Even those that are shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. That's where they are. You used to be there. You used to worship her at that temple. But now you have found out there's one greater. 
For he is our peace who hath made both one, and having broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And that was a literal wall in the temple. There was a wall in the temple that had a sign on it in Jesus' day that said, Gentile, if you go past this wall, you're a dead man. Because Gentiles were not allowed. Jesus tore that down because he grafted us into Israel, and Israel is the only one not under the authority or principality or power, but under the direct authority of Yahweh Elohim. For he is our peace, who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now underline in your Bible, contained in ordinances. That is a specific part of Torah concerning temple worship and how Gentiles could not get in. He did not say here that he eliminated the commandments of God. It said the, the part of the Torah that did not allow Gentiles to go further, that's the reason why that wall was there in the temple. He abolished that so we could get in. That's a whole other sermon. For to make in himself of the twain one new man so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the empty thereby, and came and preached peace to you that were afar off and to them that are nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of one household." and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, who was the first prophet. Don't think New Testament. The first prophet was Abraham that walked with God. The first apostle was Moses. You know what that means? Here's Jesus, the cornerstone. Abram lined up with Jesus. Moses lined up with Jesus. Elijah lined up with Jesus. Elisha lined up with Jesus. Samuel lined up with Jesus. David lined up with Jesus. He wasn't talking about John and Peter. and He was talking about the saints of the first covenant in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, in any of that, did you hear the concept of spiritual warfare? Is it there in the text? If it was there in the text, then he would have given us a detailed position on how that we from a third heaven reality can bombard principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness. It does not exist in the text. It doesn't fit in the context. And when we try to add that to it, we are guilty of isogesis. We are guilty of reading into scripture that which is not there. And here's what he's describing. Okay, you were here, you're now here, and now you are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, which means we are now out of the domain of the principalities and powers and the, and the rulers of darkness that are ruling planet Earth. It does not mean that we go after them from there. There is no instruction in the Word of God telling us to attack principalities and powers and rulers. There is another protocol for that. And one of the protocols he just laid out, by winning the lost, we pull more people out of their domain, therefore we weaken that principality or power. But if they're constantly getting in our faces, we, because I'm born again, my spirit man is now alive to God, and the word says I can come boldly before the throne of God that, that I might receive mercy in a time of need, and therefore since I am seated there, I can turn to my king and say, I need you to be a man of war. I need heaven to move. I need you to empower us to preach the gospel. I need you to give us the fire of God so that we can win the souls of men. And would you send warring angels to begin warring against these things that are going on in the second heaven so that we can have the freedom to preach the gospel. I mean, I got into a long conversation about this with a Christian book publisher 
that was trying to knit together. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and one day we will judge angels, which is way back in the book of Revelation. After all things done, what we will do is we will give testimony before God as he judges them. And try to knit that together. You can, guys, let me tell you something. You can snip and clip and paste verses together and make it say anything. Context is key. If you take it out of context, you're walking on, on shallow, shaky, unstable, dangerous ground. We have got to stop taking little pieces here and little pieces there and make things sound that sound really good to the flesh. When you look at all of Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2, it's not about us, it's about Him and what He has done for us. But in those scriptures, you're never going to see a saint turn and say, now that I'm up here in the second heaven, thank you, Jesus, just go ahead and keep your seat. I've got it from here. And I'm going to go rumble with the principality of power. That is not in the text. And it is perilous to put it in there. Because we have been given ground warfare, God handles the air warfare. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans, as the powers of Mystery Babylon gathered to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the son of perdition's return. Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com that's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.